Uh, right now, we have a pretty special investor here. All right. Now, David Lee has uh, done a thing or two with investing over the years. He's one of the founding members, uh, one of the founding partners, rather, of SV Angel, a little investment outfit you may have heard of, invested in a few things. Airbnb, Dropbox, Twitter, Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's hear a little bit of his insights gained over the years about all things startups. Please clap it up. David. <clears throat> so um, I, I have to admit, some, I've, I've spoken a lot. I'm a little nervous right now. Um, my daughter is here, I've never spoken in front of her, and my mother-in-law is here, so if I stumble, just, you know, bear with me. Um, but uh, let me just say this, there has never been a more exciting or better time to start a company. From what's happening in mobile computing and different areas like drones, virtual reality, Bitcoin, bioinformatics, there are so many different areas to explore as, as, a, as a startup founder. So I'm really honored to be here um, and really excited for you as you think about starting a company. So um, as Alexis mentioned, I've been angel investing since 2007. Um, really with Ron, I've been doing that with Ron Conway and SV Angel. Um, so it's been about seven years, but it feels like dog years. Um, through that time, I've worked with probably over 500 founders, and the team and I at SV Angel have reviewed over 6,000 business plans. So as Alexis mentioned, some of those companies, and I don't know where the clicker is, um, some of those companies include uh, Pinterest, Dropbox, Square, Stripe, GitHub. Many of these companies uh, and many of these founders have spoken here at Startup School. Um, so I really encourage you to, to go back, go to YouTube, listen to their stories because some of their stories are really telling because particularly when they started their company, they're not the, the people that you see today. So given all of this data that we have, and I, obviously given the number of companies that we've reviewed and the companies that we've worked with, not all, if not most of the companies are not the Pinterest, Dropbox, Airbnb, and Stripe. I thought what I would do today is, for you is really three things. The first thing I would do is tell you a little bit about what we look for at SV Angel when evaluating a startup. The second thing I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what you should be looking for when picking investors. There's never been a better time as a, as a startup founder to seek financing, reasons which I'll get into a little bit later. And so it's important to be discerning and think about what you should be looking for. And the final thing that I'm gonna share is the biggest lesson that I've learned from Ron Conway in my seven years of working with him. So uh, as Alexis mentioned, you know, Ron has, is a prolific angel investor, has been investing since tw for about 20 years, and really invented this class of angel and seed investing. And this one thing he taught me, I, I bring it up over and over again, and I think it has particular relevance for you as a startup founder, or if you decide to work for a company, or you decide to be an investor. And frankly, it's the one lesson that I always think about when we decide whether or not to invest in a founder again. So um, before I get sort of more specific, I, I want to tell you a story about the first founder or entrepreneur that I've ever known. Um, and that's my dad. So my dad graduated with his PhD in mechanical engineering from UCLA in 1962. He was the first Asian to, to graduate in that graduate program. And then in the mid-70s, he worked at a company called Alpha Industries. And so for, for those of you, I mean, this probably, I'm dating myself, but in the mid-80s, mid-70s, Route 128 in Boston, that was Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was the upstart. That was Silicon Valley, Soma, as hot as you can get. And he was a senior engineer at, at one of these high-flying companies. And so he did that for about five years. And one day, and this is about the early 80s, he decided to quit. 
and he realized that even though he was very happy doing what he was doing and he had two kids to provide for and a family, he, he wasn't following his passion. And his passion really was building things for other people and for other companies. And he thought, if others could do it, why couldn't he? So he just quit, didn't know what the product was, and decided to go out on his own, a very risky venture. So the first product that he built was a, the first fully automated fortune cookie machine. So before my dad's machine, you made fortune cookies by hand. And he built the machine that automated the whole process. So it was sort of a robotic startup before its time. Um, and I don't know if any of you remember, there, there used to be those fortunes with the smiley faces on them. Those were my dad's. That's how I went to college. So, um, so uh, thank you. Um, and, but this was the first product that he was going to use to catapult his whole company, because he wanted to build other things. Um, but it turns out there was actually a decent market for fortune cookie machines and fortune cookies. People eat them. And 30 years later, at 79 years old, he is still building these machines. And he's doing it, I mean, it's a great story and it sounds good. And he's doing it in one part because he loves it. He would rather do nothing else than build. But there's another part where he does it because he has to. He does it because he has to do it to keep the lights on. Because this 30-year journey, which I witnessed and lived through, it's something, the ups and the downs, it's something that we're, it's borderline, I mean, it's gut-wrenching. It's really hard. And I'm sure a lot of founders have talked about this. But there is the one thing that I've learned in that sort of being his son is the price you have to pay in order to do what you love for a living. And that's a pretty steep price. Um, and that's why we try to really stand behind all of the founders who do it, because we, we know it's not easy. So um, with that in mind, I, I want to jump into what we look for at SV Angel. So I'm going to give access to all of you to this one document. And many here at Y Combinator have seen it. And it's the document that we have used since I started working at SV Angel. It's a document that Ron wrote 20 years ago and a document that we refined over time. And it's the one document that, that's really, it's our Magna Carta, it's our Bill of Rights. And it's called, appropriately, <laughs> What Ron and SV Angel Look For in a Company. And it is simply just a laundry list of items that we look for over the, and over the years, things that, that just remind us. It's almost like a checklist. And so given that it's a laundry list, and I will share this with you afterwards, what I wanted to do is just point out one or two laundry list items and tell you, you know, what we look for and why these things are important to us. So the first point that I want to highlight is that and the very first line in this document, and this is, the, this is a sentence that Ron wrote 20 years ago. So you have this title, and then you have this line. And so for those, this is a little inside baseball. You can see this is sort of a weird, lots of weird typos, all caps. This is just how, not, there are a lot of grammat grammatical nits in, in this document. But this document talks about the team. We at SV Angel, we look at founders first, ideas second. We believe that ideas morph, but people don't. If we like the founder and we believe in the founder, more than likely we will invest if it's a sector that we like. And for us, there are some particulars. We may like, we've always um, preferred founders who build things for themselves or founders whose company is an extension of their life story and that this, the, the founding of a company has been built, it's been built up over years. Um, but not all startups are like that. And one thing that I do want to emphasize is that what we look for may be very different from what other investors look for. And so hopefully, though, that this is just one proxy and some insight into how we make decisions. So um, one of the qualities that I want to talk about and one of the items in our laundry list is this. Good elevator pitch, keep it simple. Now, again, this probably, you know, if I was re looking at this for the first time, my eyes would glaze over. I'd say, of course you have to have a good elevator pitch. 
You know, this is, it's written in every single MBA textbook. But this is, there, there's a nuance to this. So um, in this environment where startups are more popular than ever and more smart people are going to startups than ever, I believe that the single most important skill for a founder as the leader of his or her company is to be able to express their vision to other people. And your ability to communicate that to prospective employees, investors, and customers is critical in this environment where there's so much noise and people have so many different options. You know, when you start your company and you're trying to hire somebody, you will see how many options this candidate has. And I, I want to be clear about something as, as well. You know, this is not about being a great public speaker. This is not about, um, you know, being Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton and having this magnetic charisma. You know, some of the best startup pitches and the best startup founders that I've known are some of the most classically inarticulate people that, I, that you would meet. And, you know, experts say that 80% of communication is nonverbal, it's body language. And your ability to express that vision is critical in, in this environment. So, I want to give one example or one story of this. So, I met Rick Morrison in, at Y Combinator Demo Day. I think it was in the winter of 2011. Rick's company, Comprehend Clinical, what they do is they take disparate data sources in, in a Palantir-like way, and they, they bring them together, and they make the data actionable and usable to shorten and make clinical trials uh, more efficient for pharmaceutical companies and, um, and researchers. Um, at the time, and I'm, that is, this is not photo sharing. It's not something that you look at and go, wow, this is awesome. This is something that, you know, healthcare IT was not something that made me lean forward. And so at demo day, Rick said, hey, can, can we grab some coffee? And to be courteous, I said, yeah, let, let's grab some coffee. Um, and I knew what the pitch was, and he told me about it. And he seemed like a very nice guy, and his background was in this area. So we ended up meeting about a week or two later. And we met at um, this cafe on University Avenue in Palo Alto. And for those of you who don't know, University Avenue is like the Times Square of startups in Silicon Valley. It's just, you see everybody, it's very loud, it's very crowded, and so we sat down in a coffee shop. And again, this was more of a courtesy, see if I could help him as an entrepreneur after demo day. And he was able to, in that short period of time, in that environment, he talked to me about what he was trying to do and why this whole process was fundamentally broken, and why this was such a big opportunity, and why he was the person. And he talked about how this could impact people's lives, and the timing was right because what was happening with Obamacare, and what was happening with the digitization of genomic data, and in his background, and, and you know, his co-founder with expertise in machine learning. And by, the 40, by 45 minutes, I was hooked, and we invested right there. And his ability to articulate that vision, and this picture is a picture of him with his co-founder signing our term sheet, I felt like if he could pitch, if he could make me interested in this topic, in healthcare IT, in 45 minutes, what could he do with a prospective employee, or a prospective investor, or a prospective customer? And I just said, that is the type of person that I want to back. And for me, as somebody who's 44 years old, that is something I think about. I think about, does this person have the potential to be somebody that I would want to work for and that I would want to get behind? And so, again, he was not the most, uh, you know, I hope he's not listening, most charismatic person, but he was able to express his vision in a very authentic way, and that in a very authentic, infectious way. So the second item that I want to sort of highlight from this laundry list, and that's Rick's company. And again, this is straight from the document. Good listeners, strong-willed, but flexible. So the, the flip side of being a good communicator, in my opinion, is what I've learned in my time investing is that the be very best founders are great listeners. And by that I mean, 
they're not, um, I don't mean listeners in the empathetic sense. I mean listeners in the sense of taking multiple inputs, si uh, processing and synthesizing all of them, and being able to come to a decision or a point of view based on all of those inputs and sticking to that, that vision. You know, Ron has always told me that Mark Zuckerberg, this is his greatest strength. His ability to listen and think about all the different opinions, all the data points, and come up with a vision based on that is the best that he's ever seen. And so that ability to me, again, you will have many investors, you'll have many advisors, you'll have many mentors, and they'll all be telling you different things. Or, or they may be telling you the same thing. And your ability to process that and synthesize that and make your decision based on that is something that it, it's really, it's a skill that's invaluable. Because we have seen um, many, many founders who are strong-willed but inflexible. These are bad listeners. These are founders that we probably wouldn't back again. These are founders who have a point of view and it's inspirational and it's strategic and it's smart but it's wrong. And it's wrong in hindsight, of course, but at the time, the way they, don't, they just don't listen. They ignore the inputs because they have one point of view. So I'm gonna use Rick again as an example. Um, so we invested in Rick, he did his seed. Uh, he, um, and then six months later, as often happens, he hit a rough patch and he realized that not everybody bought into his vision from a fundraising standpoint, and not all of the customers were biting either. And so, like all startups, there was just this point of doing okay but not doing great. And the thing that Rick did over, and I've seen it, the thing that he did over this six month period is that he really listened. He got to multiple inputs. He really understood and asked great questions. Why? Why aren't you buying this? Why aren't you investing? With one particular investor, he invested, he pitched them three times. And he did this with multiple investors. And each time they said no, he, he said why? What's the feedback? Why, why wouldn't you invest? What do I need to do better? And some of the things that they told him, he ignored. But some of the things that he, they told him, he said, you know what, they might be right. And when, when those opinions resonated with the opinions of his customers, he took his product and he moved it from a hosted solution to a SaaS solution. And by this third pitch with this one investor, the partner said to him, you're the most persistent SOB I've ever met. And, but he couldn't ignore the progress. And by the fourth time he pitched this firm, Sequoia Capital, the chairman of the firm, Doug Leone, stood up and clapped. And they eventually invested in his company. And that is, I think this is the best example, one of the best examples that I've seen of a founder getting to the root cause. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen I've seen companies pitch either an investor or a customer, and they say no, and then they give them the same pitch with maybe some progressive data. And they're not getting to the root cause as to why somebody is saying no. It's okay to go back, it's okay to be persistent, so long as you're going with a different, with a different angle and a different vector, a more informed angle or more informed vector. So those are just a couple of things, and again, what we look for in a company is really just a laundry list of what we look for in people. I can't tell you the number of times, you know, I've been working with Ron and we talk about a founder and he'll say to me, he or she is a good founder or he or she is a bad founder. And they're not, he's not talking about Mark Zuckerberg or Ben Silberman or the people who have flamed out. These are just the people who are, who are going through their startup right now. And it's because they do some of these things. They, they, they do some of the things that are simple but not easy. So that's, those are just a couple of items. And again, I'll share this list with you. Now I want to take sort of a flip side and talk about what you should look for when, looking, when speaking to investors and looking for money. So you're going to hear a lot of different uh, you know, viewpoints and a lot of different advice. In my opinion, it's just one thing, and one thing only. 
value add. The only thing you should think about is that every investor needs to add value. And this statement is kind of like a Rorschach test. It's like value add is different things to different people and different founders. It means something completely different for a first time founder doing an enterprise company to a second time founder doing something in consumer. It depends on the founder, the market, and the industry. And you as the founder, you should really think about, be self-critical of, of you and your company to think about what are some of the known unknowns, as uh, Don Rumsfeld says. Like, what are some of the challenges that I can anticipate? Even though most of the challenges are going to be unknown, you at least want to think about, hey, who, who do I think can help me? And what do I need to do to get him, and her, him or her on my side? And so a lot of founders focus on valuation and dilution. And we've always said, if you just focus on this and you focus on value add versus ownership in the company, then the valuation discussion just flows from that. So I'll give you one example. So we invested in a guy named Jason Tan. And his company is SIF Science. So Jason, um, he was doing a company and is doing a company that currently is in um, preventing fraud for e-commerce. As, as some of you know, e-commerce is changing the way people buy, the way people sell, and so the fraud problems are different. And we invested in him. We we're very excited about the company. And an opportunity came up for him. Now, this, now an opportunity came up for uh, somebody, uh, an individual named Max Levchin. You, you may know who he is. He was the, one of the founders of PayPal probably one of the best people in the world when it comes um, to this area. And he's spoken here at startup school. Um, and Max said to him, hey, I want to get involved in this company. And I want to help you. But here's the thing. I want you to, to stay with me. I want you to you know, sit in our office. I want to mentor you one day a week. I want to really dig deep and, and help you here. And I spoke to Jason about it. And the, the terms were different, probably more favorable to Max than other investors. But I said, you, you have to do this. I mean, this is, you can't work, you know, and not that he was, but don't worry about the dilution or what your cap table looks like. Worry about getting the best people who will add the most amount of value to your side. If Max wanted to invest and said, hey, I'll give you 100K and maybe I'll have you know, breakfast with you once or twice a month, that's a different proposition than what Max was offering. And so Jason, without much thought, decided to work with Max. And today, he is a company that, uh, his is a company that's doing well, and Max was instrumental in that. And now that's an extreme case, and um, hey, for some of you, and for many of you, it'll be the case that the, the biggest value add for the investor is that the money is green, and that they want to invest. But for those of you who have choices, and the reason why I say that this is the best time to raise money is that you will have more, you have more choices than ever. You know, with what's happening um, here at Y Combinator, AngelList, the Jobs Act, crowdfunding, Kickstarter, these companies are changing the way, that it's expanding the number of sources um, for financing, both debt and or equity that you can raise. There are many, many companies now, many may be overstating it, but it's not uncommon right now, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the next year, there are many companies who get financed on Kickstarter, some of the other crowdfunding platforms, and then go straight to the larger VCs. And so with all of these different choices, you really want to be discerning in thinking about what value is an investor going to add. So, the final thing that I want to talk about, and I'm bumping up against my time, this is the one lesson that I've learned from Ron. It's the biggest lesson that I always think about. And this is, it's simply this. Never forget your reputation is your biggest asset. Now, um, you as the founder, and this, this is also some laundry list items from, from this part. You as the founder, what I can say is building your reputation is the best investment you can make in your career in technology. And it's the best way that you can sort of build your, 
your, your career. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is leading by example. You want to be completely focused on your, on your startup. Everybody is going to be looking at you. And you want to control what you can control. I don't know how many startups or how many founders um, who ignored this and who ignored the little things. So for example, when Ron did, um, Ron would, you know, invested in 1998, he would talk about how they would have seminars for best practices. Sergey Brin and Larry Page were the only ones who showed up to every single one. Now I'm not saying that's because they, that's why they're Google, but it's just an example of controlling what you can control. Another example, Joseph Walla, hello sign. We at SV Angel, we have cocktail parties um, for our CEO summits where we bring our investors, partners, and CEOs. He came and he tapped me on the shoulder and he had a po yellow post-it of all the people he wanted to meet who could be helpful for his company. He was the only founder who did that. And this was a cocktail party. Most of it thought it was a boondoggle. He thought it was work. I will never forget that. So in summary, um, I, I've given you a lot of sort of platitudes, a lot of things that could be written on tweets or fortune cookies. Be a good leader, lead by example, look for value add investors, be a good listener. Um, but I can't emphasize enough that that's just a starting point for this journey that you're going on. Um, we, we really know that this is simple but not easy. It's a lot of hard work to really follow and do what you love. And we at SV Angel can't be more excited about the environment and can't be more excited about meeting you and possibly investing in you. Good luck. <laughs>